I live right by 309 movie theaters. Go ahead. Good morning, boys. Welcome to the Fitzpatrick Bee Farm. This is one of our mock-up beehives. Uh, the weather today is not very agreeable. It's only about 55 degrees, and the bees do not like to uh, fly. They get a little nasty when it gets around this temperature, and they just stay in the hive. Uh, over on the side here and behind me are two golden delicious apple trees. Uh, they're right now in what is called full bloom. Uh, can you make a close-up of this? Okay, this is one of the key crops that the bee pollinates. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pick off what is called the side blooms from the apple and leave the single center one, which is called the king bloom. You're about a week late to see this, but in the center here, there is one fertilized ovule left and this will develop very rapidly into uh, the largest apple in the cluster that's called the king bloom and that is the one that you try to get pollinated first and pollinated well so that this develops into the large elongated apple that you see from Washington State so it's important that you do have bees present early on and that's why orchardists bring the bees into the orchard now this mock-up hive, this is made up of a whole series of what is called shallow supers. These are half size versus the deep full body, which you will see when we get over to the apiary. But I put this together since we can't do this with the, uh, the bees themselves, so you can see what a beehive is. Beehives consist of uh, a landing board, which is this bottom one, and a bottom board. The landing board has a dual function. It keeps the bees from uh, landing in the grass in front of the hive and on a cool evening or early morning they get chilled and they don't have enough strength to crawl up. This gives them easy access to the entrance to the hive. This is the main entrance to the hive right here and the bees go into the hive which is actually composed of a series of bottomless boxes in which frames are suspended. So we'll open up this mock-up. There's no bees in here. We're gonna take off the outer cover. This is a solid metal covered cover that is heavy enough to prevent wind from blowing it off. Inside is an additional cover. This is called the inner cover. The purpose of the inner cover is it gives you access to uh, get access to the hive uh, without having to worry about the bee glue. Bees collect sap from buds of trees, which is called propolis, and it's one of the strongest uh, glues that nature makes. And they glue all the surfaces, wherever there's a crack that they can't get to, they glue it up with this propolis. So by having the inner cover, you have access to put a pry bar in here, and you actually have to use a pry bar to open up the hive. And then once you're in, you can access these frames which contain the honeycomb. There are 10 of them in, a high, in each super, and as you can see, it's bottomless. Now, back in the 1800s, Langstroth, who was a famous bee researcher, discovered what is called the bee space. Uh, the bee space is 9 sixteenths of an inch. It is the space upon which a bee can readily pass through, yet it is not so large that he will not fill that space with comb. So Langstroth designed what is called the movable frame hive using this principle that allows you to have access to any part of the hive by lifting these frames out and not have to worry about them all being covered with a uh, with bee glue and so you can easily work it. Now this honeycomb is rather dark. The reason is brood has been raised in here more than once and what gives the comb the dark color is the cocoons that the bees do leave. 
So each one of these boxes contains frames like this. It goes all the way to the bottom. Also, because of the spacing in these combs, uh, it allows air to circulate freely through here. Uh, the bees will line up at the bottom board and they'll actually line up side by side like soldiers. They'll be all the way inside the inside walls and up through the frames, all facing the same direction and fanning their wings. The hotter the temperature, the more bees are doing this so they can exchange air in the hive. You can actually blow smoke in on top of those bees and see a puff blow out the other side in a, about 15 seconds later and that gives you an idea how the air does circulate in the hive. Bees were also the original inventor of air conditioning. Uh, the way they do this is by evaporation of water. When the temperature gets so high that they cannot just by circulating air, they actually reduce the temperature by bringing in droplets of water and scattering it throughout the hive in front of the fan of air that they're blowing. The evaporating uh, of the moisture takes energy out of the air which actually reduces the temperature and on a hot day it can save a hive that might otherwise melt down from the heat of the sun shining on it. So you have the basics that's in the beehive uh, and we'll get in a little bit into how we manipulate the hive. We'll put it back together right now. Just wanted to show you several other pieces of equipment here. Uh, after the honey is gathered and it's time to take it off the bees how do you get to it? Because all these frames are filled with thousands of bees. Uh, in a peak period of time in June, you may have 50 to 75,000 bees in, in, in each individual hive. So the beekeeper has invented devices such as the bee escape. What you do, you take these boxes that are full of bees, you temporarily remove the, the number that you want to take the honey from while leaving others for the bees for their sustenance. You put this device down on top and then put the frames full of bees uh, back on and close it up. Now what happens overnight is this board, the bees cannot fit through these spaces. There's a channel here that on the other side we have these one-way cones and the bees, they hear the sounds of the bees in the lower hive. They enter these holes from the top and pop out of the cones. However, they find it very difficult to find their way back in through the cones. So in normally a day or so, all these boxes will be empty of bees. You can come along the next day and remove them and take them into your extracting chamber where you remove the honey from the, from the honeycomb. Over here we have a device which is called a solar wax extractor. This using the energy of the sun uh, takes waste wax that would otherwise go to waste and melts it into nice yellow or even whitish wax that can be recovered to make candles or even make foundation to make additional honeycomb. The hotter the day, the better it works. What you do, you put scrap pieces of honeycomb and wax in here. The sun melts it and it drips down into a tray in the bottom and therefore uh, you're, you're able to recover that wax and make utility out of it. Learn that they can be smoothed up quite a bit by puffing gently some smoke, not too hot a smoke, into the beehive. Uh, this is called the fire chamber here. This is the bellows that you force air through. So I'm going to light it up. One thing I might want to point out here is from previous burns, you can see inside here condensed creosote, which has uh, formed inside here. This is the same type of creosote that comes from burning wood that accumulates on your chimney. And if it gets too heated, it can cause a very hot uh, fire in a chimney because it will reliquify when it gets hot enough and the dripping creosote will, will burn very vigorously and cause a serious fire in a chimney. Thus, if you do burn wood, it's a good idea to eliminate the creosote periodically in your uh, chimney. Now, as we go here, We'll try to light this. I have broken up uh, pieces of sassafras wood. I have found that sassafras uh, is the best wood to use in uh, smoking bees. It seems to soothe them and tone them down uh, very nice without irritating them too much. So what we do, we add some wood slowly. 
until it does catch. You don't want fire in the firebox, even though they call it a firebox. You want a slow burning wood without much flame. And of course, this is what causes the creosote to form so aggressively. So you need a hot fire to get it burning, but then you want it just to smolder. And uh, the reason for this is what it does is it gives the bees uh, a cool smoke, not a real hot smoke. Hot smoke stings them and uh, has the opposite of this, the soothing effect. It will actually irritate them. So we have enough wood in there now that we can uh, let it just keep burning a little. Now my able assistant over here, I'm going to give him the smoker to puff for a few minutes and just puff it until it gets going pretty well and then uh, we'll be able to just let it mellow out a little bit and then we'll be set. So uh, we're going to take our toolbox up here. I always carry a mirror with me. That's in case I get a sting in the back of the neck or somewhere that I can't see, uh, I can locate it. These devices are called entrance cleats. These go in the entrance of the hive uh, throughout the fall and winter. They're small enough that mice cannot get in and ravage a hive when the bees are in semi-hibernation, yet it allows the bees enough air and access in and out. We'll now go up to the apiary. Okay, now we're in the apiary. An apiary is a place where bees are kept. Uh, because we're in a suburban area, I've secured the bees behind a fence so that we do not have to worry about uh, young children getting in or dogs uh, getting stung. Uh, this fence has a dual purpose. Uh, in addition to giving security, it also forces the bees to fly up so that they fly over the heads of any, any people. Now you'll notice I have a white coat on. Uh, bees like white. It, it is not an offensive color to them, whereas colors such as brown or, or black are because uh, it reminds them of their natural enemies such as bears. So by wearing white, it, you're kind of in tune with them, and as long as you move slowly, normally there are no problems. Now, if you will look, for example, here at this hive, you will see that this box is deeper than this box. This box is what is called the brood chamber. That's where the bees raise their young. The shallow boxes are where the surplus honey goes. The normal conformation for a hive is to have two boxes, two deep boxes, or supers, and the bottom one is called the brood chamber, the upper one is the food chamber. And during the winter time, the hives are only this high after the honey is taken off. Uh, as you can see, maybe you can swing the camera around, you can see that there are eight hives here. Some of them are larger than others. The reason is that uh, some hives are stronger than the others. The queen is able to produce more eggs and therefore build up a larger population. And you have to continually add boxes to uh, uh, accommodate this population. Otherwise, the bees will swarm or leave the hive. One interesting side note was we lit the smoker a minute ago so that we can calm the bees down. Uh, a few years ago, there was a high-tech product called an aerosol hive bomb that had concentrated smoke in it. However, the EPA has banned this because uh, they, they found that there was some creosote in it. So that's no longer available. It was a nice, convenient little thing to use, but uh, we've gone back to the old-fashioned way. Uh, one thing I want to show you before we open up a hive is have a very interesting situation here. We have a symbiotic relationship between a colony of ants and the beehive. Uh, this box right here is left over from the winter, unknown to me, in the insulated container where the, the sugar syrup is stored that I do feed them in the winter if it's a weak hive. There was a colony of ants. The ants have taken advantage of the hive and the heat that the bees give off to advance their season and actually start raising young. They were doing this back in February. In addition, their main food source is dead bees that they scavenge off the ground at night. So it, it's a very nice relationship between the two species. So, well, oh, I'm sorry, this is a, a spoiled hive. You may want to take a look at this. This is a hive that died. And what you see here is cocoons from the wax moth who actually have destroyed this entire hive. This will all have to be cleaned out and replaced. 
So uh, this is just stored here. It, it has no other purpose right now. So we're going to go and take a look at the ant colony now. And uh, I think you may find this of interest. Jamie, if you want to take a look down inside there, you can see some of the ants with some of their uh, larvae that are over a hot spot in the hive. Okay. So we'll take a look again at this symbiotic relationship and you can see an active ant colony that is feeding off of a beehive. Inside here is the winter home. It showed up here so we can take a look right here. Inside here is the winter home. You may even see the queen ant in there. Inside this hollow is where we put the uh, jar of sugar water which we feed the bees on occasion during the winter. So looking down there you can see both pupil cases and also larvae of, of this colony of ants. These are common black ants and uh, they're not really of, of any detriment to the bees. So we'll close that up. Just lift your finger when you're starting to roll. Or are you rolling now? I am rolling. Okay. This is the front entrances of the hives and the bees have access in and out without interference from the beekeeper having to, to work there. We're now going to open up this hive. If you want to bring the camera around here, you may be able, well, that may be a good spot, so leave it there. Uh, we'll open up hive number six. This is called a hive tool. That's the beekeeper's friend because it enables you to actually go and uh, pry parts of the hive that the bees may glue together. We're taking off the outer cover and as you can see, there's, there's a few ants here that strayed away. What happened yesterday, I moved their nest from here to there. They didn't realize it, and now they're sort of lost souls. So now we're going to lift up the inner cover carefully. You can see how you have to pry it if you can hear the glue breaking. I have a couple of frames that were glued here. So uh, this super, I just happened to put on yesterday. You can take a look at the inside of the inner cover and you can see how the bees here are actually building additional honeycomb. We'll give them a gentle puff of smoke and this should enable us to lift the frame out so you can see the bees working on this. There are not a lot here right now because it's a cool day most of them have gone to the lower part of the hive. Now what you see here is a flat sheet of wax with the indentation of the cells. Uh, this is called wax foundation and if you look carefully you will see that there are little wires there. These wires give support. The purpose of them is in the extractor when you use these combs over and over again the wires give additional support so that uh, the comb does not collapse when it is being extracted. Uh, you can see how flat it is. Now I'll lift up the adjacent one and you will see that they have actually extruded some of the wax out and made a, uh, a honeycomb from it. Also notice that it's much lighter than some of the combs you have seen before. There's actually some areas where they're starting to add honey. That's what this darker part is. So, boys, that's uh, about as far as we can go on a cloudy day with a beehive. We cannot go and look for the queen because uh, we... Thanks a lot for coming and taking a little tour of the hives. I'm sorry that uh, the weather is such that we can't hunt for a queen, but please fly.